Hello, friends. It's Binge O'Clock, the podcast where we watch something and then we talk about it. I'm Joy Selden, and I've seen almost everything. I'm Danielle Nga, and I've seen almost nothing. Episode 5 of Almost Human, which is called Blood Brothers, is a Mm. wild ride. I'm so glad (laughs) you were able to come with me on this magical journey. (laughs) Me too. I texted Joy immediately after this and said, oh, we are going to be in danger of making this podcast episode far too long because there is so much to discuss. There's a lot of things that happen. I, we, I, I had flashbacks <laughs> to the pilot, honestly. There was just a lot of tech and a lot of hitting mm-hmm. you real fast with tech. And it was like, wait, wait, I need to write it down. And there was a lot of pausing and writing down a thing. And oh, my goodness. So this, <laughs> this episode could definitely highlight some of the 400% for those mm-hmm. of you fans of 400% out there. <laughs> Were you missing it? Here it is. Here it is. We've got it for you. In this neat little box. <laughs> so what happens in this episode is while Captain Maldonado is giving testimony at Ethan Avery's hearing, one of her key witnesses is brutally murdered at the safe house. The good news, though, is the other witness is a petite psychic. <laughs> and the boys uncover a clone plot to release Ethan, who is a very unsavory individual. Oh, yeah. But don't worry, and- they win. <laughs> don't worry, they win. And we will be getting into Ethan Avery's unsavory character further in the episode. Yes. First, though. But first. (laughs) Oh, God. I feel like it's a dumb question at this point because, wow, was everyone unprepared. How were the cops unprepared for the tech this week, Danielle? (laughs) Okay, why don't we start easy? Let's just knock out some of the easy ones. Yeah. We get big guns. Rapid fire. Finally. Yes. We get the big guns. This high-capacity assault assault issue, something that's banned for street use. We get the armor-piercing high-caliber shotgun that literally erupts an android's entire head. Yeah, that was very graphic and very... Super! uh, Just uh, surprising. (laughs) It kind of just came out of nowhere. Clearly, the police are unprepared for this because they have bulletproof technology of a sort, but clearly that technology doesn't protect anyone from this specific weapon. So, great, we've got that. Let's just knock out the trackers because we have to knock out the trackers. The way that the way that the baddies find the safe house in the first place is that they place a tracker on a bailiff, which the police officers do know how to detect. The MXs can detect trackers. We know that because they scan Kenex's entire car and report, oh, there are no trackers. So I guess here, really, the police... Officers maybe just need to tighten up their security a little bit, you know, like maybe have the MXs scan everyone as they enter because we have things like trackers and subcutaneous wires in this universe. Which is amazing to me because you would think as soon as you got to the safe house, someone would be like, hang on a second. Hold on. One second. (laughs) No, absolutely not. And so a key witness was brutally killed. In Good front job. of an entire courtroom of people. In front and of an entire... It was, oh. it, was, it was bad. It was bad, friends. I'm, You know what? I'm not even going to stop to discuss what made it bad because it was bad. Then, I suppose the next thing we could discuss is the cerebellix procedure. Joy, do you want to take this one? Oh, the cerebellix procedure. So, I, I'm such a sucker for the weird pseudoscience that happens in <laughs> science fiction sometimes. Yes. Where it's just like... What if we could expand your brain? Oh, I'm sure you probably wrote it down. It's something like, oh, yeah, it's a new procedure that, like, broadens your mental state or something and allows you to use more sections of your brain, which, by the way, is so 2013. I can't even. (laughs) (laughs) Where it's just like, when you're not using all of your brain, well, actually. (laughs) Did you know that humans only use 10% of your brain? Isn't that the premise for... A Scarlett Johansson movie it of is. some sort. That movie yep. is called Lucy, and I don't oh. recommend it. <laughs> it's, look, and then there's that other movie where someone takes a, a pill that allows them to use the entirety of their brain. Limitless. Who's in that one? Oh, no. Oh, no. What's his name? The person. The man with the beard. 
<laughs> Who's saying was, in the thing with was, Lady Gaga? I know. He was literally <laughs> Rocket in Guardians of the Galaxy. He was the face no, in the A team. He's like a literally very famous actor. Extremely famous and person. Is his like, name Brad? Bradley Cooper. Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> we got there. <laughs> Back to the cerebellix procedure. It's, uh, it is a way to broaden your horizons, and in some, <laughs> I almost said human beings, as if they would do this on <laughs> robots, and in some people, it gives them a psychic ability where they can either sense people who have passed on through objects or uh, actually sense energies around people. They basically have a quote-unquote better understanding of the world around them. And it's awesome from what I'd say. Mm -hmm. Like, I love that she describes it as like, I'm the one that like it worked, like it worked on me. And I'm just like, oh, God, when you have to say that, like, how many times did it not work on everybody? So many times. I mean, to Dorian's point, this thing is relatively new and unproven. But I do love that she's the rare, rare human that it did work on. Yes. Um, And that Dorian is instantly charmed. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> because I mentioned Dorian, we also have to mention that not only can the cerebellix procedure add sensory abilities to some humans, it can also give you a notable increase in intelligence. Yes. At which point, Dorian turns to Kenix and says, maybe you should get this procedure. <laughs> the caddy. The caddy Dorian. I love caddy Dorian. He never went away. But we should talk about Maya. I know. He's... He's one of my favorite pieces of the show, but we'll we'll get to him. <laughs> yeah, no, Maya Maya is awesome. Um, mm-hmm. She's such a she's such a little ray of sunshine. <laughs> yes, and that like, is the perfect way to describe her. And she's just so self conscious, but also can't stop herself from talking. <laughs> mm-hmm. Also, we will like one of our old nemeses, the subtitles on this show. Who uh, oh boy. They were not, I don't know if yours were messed up, but mine were kind of messed up, or they weren't necessarily matching what people were saying. And it wasn't a different line, but it was like extra lines. Oh. Like, for example. Mine when, were not like that. I, I need to hear really? this. Yes. So, for example, this happens twice. Uh, one is when Maya is in the hospital, and she's just like, well, no one's ever really called me lucky before. And it has Dorian saying, why is that? When Dorian mm. says nothing and they just mm-hmm. kind of share this like unspoken look. And then she talks about tra- you've unlocked tragic backstory and she talks about her <laughs> tragic backstory. But like it happens again at the very end of the episode when um, the van flips over. <gasps> oh, gosh. And Stahl goes, does Dorian just flip over a van? And then it, like cuts back to the van. The van explodes. And she she's supposed mm-hmm. to say. Why hasn't he ever done that before? And my brain went, why would she say that? I'm so glad she doesn't actually say that. Why? (laughs) What? Have you chased down a lot of vans? (laughs) Did she not say that? I don't think she said that. Oh, did Dorian just flip that van? Why hasn't he done that before? She hasn't said that second line. (gasps) Goodness, maybe I heard it in my head. Well, speaking of hearing voices in your head. Speaking of hearing voices in your head. But yes, Maya okay. Maya is precious and adorable, and I love her to pieces. Mm-hmm. Oh, wait, you missed a piece of tech. Oh, no, I'm not done with tech. We're about oh. 30% through tech, dear listeners. <laughs> <laughs> you missed pieces of tech. Excuse me. We're, we're about 30 minutes through the tech section, dear <laughs> listeners. Um, let's do then move on to, oh, I, you know what? Rudy gets a great scene where he comes in. Again, the police are lost in the sauce, do not know how to find. They, they just don't understand. They don't understand how, what was his name? Emmett? Avery. Goodness. Ethan Avery. They don't understand how Ethan Avery could be in two places at once. And, um, you know, they're kind of throwing out ideas. But first, Rudy comes in and says, OK, listen, we know that facial replication technology exists. DNA can be fabricated. Fingerprints can be planted. But human vocal cords can't be faked. Oh, this doesn't ring true for me. (laughs) I really, I don't understand how in a world where all of the rest of this is possible, human vocal cords are the one thing that isn't. 
But I'm just, I, I'm going to have to let it go. I'm going to have to let it go because we can't perseverate on this. <laughs> I, I, I will, just to Rudy's credit, I think there's a, there's a, because he has to work on robots so often, there's mm-hmm. a part of me that wants to believe that he understands the the variances and the tone and the shift in what a fabricated voice sounds like coming out of a robot. Mm-hmm. So maybe he's just that big of a nerd and he's decided to, like, make this a hobby. <laughs> well, that's that's definitely the truth the show has constructed. <laughs> I just don't know that I believe it. <laughs> to be entirely I honest. I have to. I'm not 100% sure I believe it either. It's, it is a far-fetched <laughs> concept that it's like, we could do it's all this far-fetched. other stuff, except... Except this. This thing, which means that every human has an audio print. But I guess... I, I, you know what? I think the show just had to create a way for the police to be able to continue this investigation. Yeah. Because, you know, going back to the original question, they have been wholly unprepared for everything that they've encountered. Right. right? I do think the show was mm-hmm. building this up to be something that was like an aha moment because mm-hmm. not two seconds before this, we get a psychic saying that, by the way, Ethan Avery killed this witness. And then you have Captain Maldonado who was like, he was literally standing in front of me in court. Mm-hmm. I could see the back of his head this entire time. And then Rudy yep. comes in with this shock and awe of like, it's Avery. And I'm like, Wow, like you had a 43-minute episode and you needed to get to this plot point really fast. (laughs) Yes, we did. We needed a way to know that it was clones, which, great. You know what? We're moving on. That's the next piece of tech the police were unprepared for. I do like that the show added a little bit of um, a flavor, I suppose, by creating the anti-replication department. (laughs) Yes, yes, which, by the way, it's just like they're so backed up. Whatever. <gasps> They're like- so backlogged. <laughs> Does that mean there are just people, criminals, I guess, because there's because it is illegal to clone humans in this world. Right. Th- they mentioned that legislation is in place. So there are criminals who are just left and right cloning each other underground. Willy nilly. They're finding <laughs> this poor department. They're finding fertility clinics that are like cool with it. <laughs> <laughs> and they were just going for it. <laughs> but again, like this brings me back to like the mask thing where you could literally look like anyone else. It's just like, yes. but if you could are, if you have such easy access to this clothing technology, then why don't you mm-hmm. literally just look like anyone else? If I was a black market person, I would probably be like, <laughs> by the way, I've got this DNA of like Whoopi Goldberg. Would you like to have Whoopi Goldberg be like a henchman for you? Like, what? <laughs> yes. Right? Like I would yes. I would Jurassic Park it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh no. You could just you could get real wacky with this. You could find an extremely effective, I don't know, security guard and just make 20 of them. Yeah. And then you have an army. And, and then, then you, you have, have an, an army. army. Which is basically this what is- Ethan Avery does. <laughs> This is why the ARD is so backlogged. This is why the ARD is so backlogged. Look, if you could do it once, you could definitely make 20 copies all at once and then have them grow up together. Which, by the way, I have questions about how old Ethan Avery's copies are. Because I'm just like, so did you also fix, like, the rapid aging nonsense, which always inevitably comes up with cloning? Because in my brain, (laughs) you should have, like, a bunch of... Are they? No, no, no. They said something like uh, he was they doing said research with 10 them years like younger. 22. Right. And he was doing like this research with Fuller like 22 years ago or something. Mm hmm. So you're telling me that Ethan is. Let's let's be. Maybe we could be generous on this one. Let's say Ethan's like 50. Right. OK. So the clones are like 40. Oh, you f- you feel me like where? What happened? I don't know. I don't know, Joy. I don't math. Is it a- <laughs> you don't math. It's true. <laughs> Every now and then there's a math and Danielle's like, why did you make me math? I just, I, I don't, mm-mm. I don't math. <laughs> but no, there's, but like, what? I, but like, this instantly means to me that you didn't grow them from children. 
right? That you didn't actually no. have births. So you had pods no, of they, replicants. They grew somewhere. them from stem cells, I think, because... I, I think that they said that at some point oh, in the episode. Oh, yeah, there's like stem a... Stem cell cloning. Mm-hmm. There's like a thing So they about grew them from cloning. literally the, the cell to the whole human. I wish I Listen. wish you guys could see Danielle's face. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what? what? I just... But, you know, let me just take a moment because I... We've been... It sounds like we've been harping on the show. And I have to take this moment to say I love this episode. I liked it way better than the Benz. And if you like the Benz, that's fine. But I loved this episode. Yeah. This episode was highly entertaining. (laughs) Highly entertaining. You have to suspend your disbelief on a lot of this tech. It's fine. That's We knew what we were getting into. It's a show about (laughs) police officers who have android partners. (laughs) The show isn't here for realism. (laughs) No, no. (laughs) Or the quote unquote latest tech. What else were they not prepared for? I assume there's the rest of the paragraph. (laughs) Yes. But you know what? Let's go ahead and end on. Let's go ahead and end on the scanners, because instead Mm. of this being some, I suppose in this situation, what they were unprepared for was birds. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, it's so true, though. So in this episode, we get to see these holographic projection. Yeah. Holographic projections. That you can use for things like if you have someone in witness protection, for example, who is needs to be in a safe house, who needs to testify, and it's not safe for them to be in the courtroom with their possible attacker, they can literally like be there as a hologram. Which, again, we were talking about before, this is why the unfortunate murder of this poor woman was witnessed by an entire courtroom, because she mm-hmm. was being beamed in at the time that they were storming the safe house. But (laughs) the good news, Maldonado is one smart cookie, and she was able to use this technology to her advantage in trying to actually, quote unquote, give Ethan Avery back to the bad guys. But he's not really there. He's a hologram projection. Mm -hmm. And it's like it's great because she gets to look dejected and he's talking to her being all smug and high and mighty and just looking straight ahead Mm -hmm. because they're walking down a hallway. And meanwhile, the other bad guy, Ethan Avery clones are just like, yes, we're getting him back. And they're able to like swap (laughs) him out with stall. Which, by the way, poor Saul. Oh, we'll get we'll get to that. But first, can we discuss how they built tension in the scene by introducing the length of the hallway? <laughs> we're running out of hallway, guys. Guys, we're running out of hallway. We've got maybe ten feet. Something's got to happen. Come on, <laughs> twenty feet, ten feet, five feet. They are walking closer to each other. The slowest I have ever seen humans walk closer to each other. <laughs> I know. And there's, there's a part of me that's just like Ethan Avery was that much of like a hedonist that he he didn't even notice. Right. Like it's just giving him more time to talk about himself. Meanwhile, that's they're so w- walking very, very slowly towards a door. <laughs> yes. Why? Why are they walking an inch a minute? He doesn't stop to ask questions. He just thinks about himself. That's a good point. But the bird flies through the hologram. The bird does fly through the hologram. It's so weird. (laughs) The scheme is disrupted. Fortunately, Stahl gets a good couple of knocks in. And as the baddies are driving off, Dorian flips the van and scene over. Dorian flips the van. Like, I think you I think you actually caught on to this in the last episode when like Rudy was in trouble. Dorian just like without even blinking, like freaking twists a guy's neck and then the dude's gone. This episode, he flips a van and all four or five clones in it just go up in flames because, of course, vans are explosive. I guess. (laughs) And explode blue, P.S. And explode blue. (laughs) This big, bright blue ball of flame and it's over. You're right. Dorian just went hard. (laughs) Zero to 60. I don't even know what, what... you know, this time it wasn't even like Rudy was in was in any sort of trouble. Last time I thought it was motivated by Rudy. Well, you know well, what? Well, I wonder if it's I wonder if this time it's because Stahl was in trouble. And like yeah. he's just really dedicated to his team. You know, like he's a fiercely mm-hmm. loyal police officer. And yeah. this is the bug in his sister. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? It's human to have unexpected emotional responses. Human to have unexpected emotional responses. Like 
I just, I, uh, he goes, he goes hard, man. He does, he does not go home. He goes hard. <laughs> and we'll, we'll get, well, we'll get to him again. But, uh, yeah. poor, poor Stahl. I do yeah. think in this episode, there's a lot of, uh, this episode was weirdly focused on the women, which I was also just like, hey, how about that? <laughs> yeah, you're right. I mean, we already talked about Maya, but I know you're just itching to get onto Maldonado. Maldonado! <laughs> She's so amazing! So, the case with Ethan Avery, like, she was the cop who found basically all the evidence, it sounds like. Mm-hmm. She's the one who's been building the case against him. She's the one who's been trying to put him away. And we don't really know exactly who Ethan Avery is. Like, I don't even think they explain who he is as a person within this world. I get the impression that, like, maybe he's a, like, a philanthropist or something or an they engineer. They definitely call him a philanthropist. Yeah. like At the end. He's, like, he's done a lot of good works I think is kind of thrown around Mm -hmm. and he wants like his name to be remembered. And then there's this little scene between the two of them. I get such incel vibes from this dude. And I instantly like my heckles went up and I could tell he was making Maldonado uncomfortable. This guy's no spring chicken. And he's looking at this police captain of just like, Oh, I bet you wish that the men actually saw you when you passed by and you mm-hmm. put on a suit and men would notice. And I'm just like, she's a police captain. People have yes. noticed. <laughs> he calls her out for having a plaque on the wall to show how much she's accomplished in her time at the police department. I just, hmm. I like measuring her to a man was all I was yes. hearing. And like and also oh, that absolutely. like absolutely and that level of like you are always gonna be lonely because oh I don't see a ring on that finger. You know, Ooh. like that stuff. And I and she she takes it, like she takes it all and then she basically is just like, I don't know how you're behind this, but you're behind this and I'm gonna put you away for a very long time. Yeah. She just she really sticks it to him. But you know, he got to her. He definitely got he did. to her. He did. And, you know, good on her because at the when I was watching it for the first time, I felt the same way. And at first I wanted her to bite back and hit him where it hurts or, some, you know, somehow, right. some way. But stepping away from it, I think you're right. There isn't there's no world in which she would have been able to bite back and hit him where it, he, it hurts because he isn't a person who can see her that way. Right. He sees her as someone who is only valuable if she is with a man and, I guess, giving birth to babies. I guess. You know? Weird. I guess. <laughs> and so, yeah, I think that she she does the only thing she can do, which is to keep herself calm, to try, and sh- to try not to show him how much he got to her, mm-hmm. and to take all of her energies and throw them towards keeping this man in prison. Yeah. Which... She did. Which she does very handily, by the way. And <laughs> very I, handily. I do think she gets to at least have a moment like that at the very end of the episode because she definitely, mm-hmm. as soon as that hammer comes down, <laughs> she basically is just, she calls him out and just says, look, your clones are dead. Your name be disappeared from the history books. Mm-hmm. No one will remember who Ethan Avery is. And you decades will go by and you will rot in prison and you will be alone and no one will know who you are. And Mm -hmm. it's like, that's all that's like the best possible thing she can say, because that's all he cares about. So narcissistic. He wanted to fill the world with more of him. Yeah. Just undistilled Ethan Avery. I've met people like this and I hate it. (laughs) Oh man. How do you feel how do you feel about that final moment they gave her where that other prosecutor told her she looked nice today? Uh look. (laughs) Do you do you wish that we had ended on it will be like you never existed or (laughs) look, I don't know. I think I think all my all, all of my children on this show deserve love and support. And there is a mm-hmm. there is a part of me that's like, you know, she's probably single for her reasons. She probably chose her career over love. She probably, you know, maybe she wasn't even interested. Like all, uh, so mm-hmm. many different things, right? You know, maybe she lost somebody she was close to and she's walled herself off. 
the fact that she's able to like accept the compliment and just kind of like smirk a little bit and walk away. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed that the show didn't make it a cold moment. Yes, that's true. Because it definitely could have been one of those moments of like the show sort of reverberating back on itself and sort of being like, well, you aren't anything without a man, right? There, mm -hmm. There is also something to be said about someone who holds their own and who has confidence within themselves and that being attractive to other people. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the mess. <laughs> this giant think quotation marks here. But I think that's the message the show was going for. You know, we weren't in the writer's room. We don't know these people. But I'm, I'm with you on that one. I think that we can give the show a bit of the benefit of the doubt here. Because they gave her, because they gave her the opportunity to close the case and to have that professional win. <laughs> now, personally, did I need it? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't think I needed it. I, I do think it's interesting to, like, have that be part of her character in, like, a very low-level kind of thing where it's not that she's closed off, right? Like, it's mm -hmm. just that, you know, either the opportunity hasn't arisen or, like, you know, things like that. Like, it's a million other things. It's not that she's Kenix. It's just that she hasn't had time to, like, really dedicate to maybe finding a partner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, time or the opportunity or just has chosen not to, as or you said Or has before. chosen not to. We really don't get a lot of Maldonado. Well, we haven't gotten a lot of Maldonado backstory. I don't know if we're going to get it. I, my instinct is we probably won't just because memory serves it's only 13 episodes. But, like, but this mm -hmm. whole episode was really a Maldonado episode. Um, oh, yeah. It it definitely, like, we practically start with her. Mm -hmm. We start with her after the locker room. But then we start with her. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of the locker room, I do think it is time for our Synth Pride slash Robotic Hearts update. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there isn't. Again, there isn't a lot this week because that wasn't, you know, last week was a Rudy episode. This week is a Maldonado episode. So there wasn't there was a lot. The moments that we were given were moments that we will remember and cherish. Yes. <laughs> the entire episode opens up with Kenix pacing impatiently back and forth while Dorian is charging. Because Dorian, again, Dorian doesn't technically sleep. Like, he he basically yeah. kind of goes into, like, rest mode and charges up his batteries. Literally. <laughs> I would like to point out that Kenex waits for nine minutes before going downstairs to I get know. Dorian because he refuses to wait any longer. Nine minutes, my man. <laughs> I don't... I don't know if that came through in my tone. I wish you could see my face, too. <laughs> <laughs> I... <laughs> I think this is a product of Dorian being the type of guy who is always on time <laughs> and Kenix being used to that and then being like, it's been nine minutes, something must therefore be wrong and going down to check on him. And then it's my favorite thing because he goes to check on him and he finds his like little standing pod and he's not in it. So now he has to like go wandering around the mm -hmm. robot locker room where they like... <laughs> I mean, I suppose this counts as tech. Like, they, I guess they have quote-unquote showers, but they have these, like, weird energy cylinders. Mm -hmm. That's, oh, like, yeah. a bunch of it's blue lights. <laughs> it's those blue lights that just kill all the germs on you without actually using water. It's a water. bunch of DNA bombs. <laughs> <laughs> that pesky DNA that gets on you when you walk around in the regular <laughs> world. Um, <laughs> now, who's going to discuss what Kenick sees when he steps into the, into the uh, locker room? Is it you or is it me? Uh, <laughs> it, can, it can be me, but I will say it in the way that you ended up texting me, because apparently you texted me this before it actually happened, which I thought was hilarious. I would like to hear it from your side then. <laughs> <laughs> so he's looking around for Dorian, and a is he completely naked? I feel like he's wearing a jacket. Or a helmet, weirdly. Or a helmet. I think I feel like he weirdly has a helmet on, something thrown over his shoulder, and then nothing else. And nothing else. <laughs> so what happens is he looks over, he sees this guy completely naked, definitely from the waist down. You and I can agree on that. And Kendall. Mm -hmm. It's a large Kendall, complete with like a thigh gap like I've never seen in my entire life. 
Yes, they're weirdly hinged. I looked and I was like, I can't imagine that they run or jump very well. Except that's not supposedly they do. <laughs> supposedly they do, but that is not the way your hip bone or your femur collect connects to your pelvis. Or like, I'm not a doctor, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> no, absolutely <laughs> not. And 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 anyone who's seen the episodes, dear listeners, if you have, you know exactly what we're talking about. It does not make <laughs> anatomical sense Mm-mm. at all. <laughs> what we do now know is that MX is definitely can't sit cross-legged because their legs can oh, 100%. move forward and back in straight lines. I'm surprised that they're not bow-legged, to be honest. I feel like that would be an issue. I feel like I feel like that's where they would go with this. But so Kenix has a lot of trouble erasing this from his brain, as mm-hmm. we all do now. Thank you, show. Thank you, show. <laughs> Listen, they gifted us Disco Face. Sometimes we have to deal with this, too. <laughs> I know. We had to pay the toll. It's fine. So Kenix is having a lot of trouble racing around with Dorian. Oh, yeah, and Dorian weirdly doesn't have his chest plate, which is fine. That comes into play later. But mm-hmm. they're driving around, and he can't. He's got such a sour face. And Dorian is like, what's the matter with you? And he's like, I can't get it out of my head. And he's like, what? Well, that, yeah, that's how I live, man. Like, they're dead eyes looking at me. And he's like, no, the mm-hmm. other thing, the Ken doll. <laughs> and Dorian's like, oh. <laughs> and then he's and then he's like, like, out of concern, I guess, for his partner or to not be super grossed out about the dude sitting next to him in the car seat. I guess he just has to know because hashtag 2013 and everybody needed mm-hmm. to know what everybody else had down their pants. <laughs> Kenix mm-hmm. is just like, you're not built like that, are you? And Dorian very yeah. slowly looks at him and is like, not that it's any of your business, but no. <laughs> My designer was more thoughtful. I'm made to look human. This is, though, after Dorian shames him a little for being so hyper-focused on this thing. When Dorian tries to say, do you understand what my life is like? This is where I live. That is what I look at every day. They're glaring at me with their lifeless eyes. I'm miserable. I know. Kenix can't let go. I know. He can't let go. He can't let go of the <laughs> thing that's making him miserable. I think that's... Was that even when Dorian was like, I need to find a new place? Yes, he needs yeah. to find a new place. Can you talk to Maldonado for me, please? No response to that, P.S. Kenix, that's when Kenix goes, you're not like that down there, are you? And this is when the show stumbles onto an unfortunate stereotype, which is that Dorian is not like that down there. And Kenix responds, is that all for one person? That's a quote from the show. That's a quote from the show. Yep. And this is where, like, you know, and Michael Yilly plays it off real well, you know, mm-hmm. as a as a as as a relatively innocent, quote unquote, robot just being like, did you want to see it? Because here it is. I can show it to you. Right. And then like he zips up his pants as a totally yep. non. <laughs> oh, man. But, you know, I couldn't I couldn't not see it. Every single episode, there are moments where you remember the show was written in 2013 and here it is. We found it. Yeah. This particular moment in this particular episode, oh boy, you got some 2013 shine. It's they the shook new... off the pilot shine. Couldn't <laughs> quite get rid of that 2013 shine. It's the new pilot shine. It's like when you're repainting a house and like you chip away paint and then you find another paint underneath and you're like, this one's even more no. cracked than what we did before. <laughs> you can take the show out of 2013, but you can't take the 2013 out of the show. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Correct. Correct. <laughs> Fortunately, the scene does turn around and kind of turn on to Kenix a little bit. And I'm happy. It does. Because I mean- <laughs> Dorian gets to dig at Kenix and say, because Kenix, Kenix asks Dorian, you're a robot. What do you do with it? Yeah. My favorite part then- is that that's like a double take because he just remembered he is talking to a robot. <laughs> Dorian goes, probably the same thing you do with yours. Nothing. Nothing. (laughs) I do plenty with mine, pal. (laughs) Oh, yeah? What's up with Detective Stahl? We can't. (laughs) And then when Valerie's dub comes over. Oh, I know. Because Dorian is (laughs) speaking to John. In the way that Valerie apparently says John's name. (laughs) Oh, no, I'm sure Dorian is putting some spin on that. 
I feel like Dorian's <laughs> putting some spin. Because he also oh is God. like, I think your fake leg is sexy. <laughs> Like, she's literally never said that sentence before never. in her life. <laughs> but I kind of like, I feel like as John was laughing along with it, he kind of liked hearing it. Right? Oh, no. A hundred percent. John was into it. <laughs> John was into it. Four hundred percent sure. <laughs> Four hundred percent sure. <laughs> And I feel like that's probably the synth ride moment. It is in this, this episode. It, yeah, you know, there's there's the other one when they're when they're in the car with Maya, which is pretty great. But that's less about synth pride and more about Maya being who she yeah, is. Yeah, just and Maya reading being great. John's aura, John's aura, <laughs> which is red, the color of anger and frustration, but also the color of apples and Christmas, <laughs> as Kenick says, bless, <laughs> bless. And, uh, you know, I think that's the episode, the long and short of it anyway. I think I think you need to tell us what your one more thing is. Okay. <laughs> My one more thing. Oh, you know what? That was actually a pretty good segue. Because <laughs> as they are, as the three of them are in the car talking about the aura and apples and Christmas and the aura pushing people away from them, they all get so involved in conversation that every single person in that car, including Kenix, takes their eyes off the road <laughs> so finally that awful wildly unsafe driving that we talked about i think in our pilot episode i it was like episode two it was like a really or maybe early, it was episode two it was like a really <laughs> early episode that i was like this driving though oh my god it's gonna get them in trouble and it did because they almost crash into that v- van full of clones van full of clones and- with semi-automatic <laughs> weapons with semiotic weapons. And I don't, <laughs> that's one more thing I wanted to discuss because I texted Joy about it as I was watching and said, oh, look, that thing that you mentioned. Oh, look, they got in a car really crash. On. It happened. And then he like backs up into another car. Like it's bad. It's bad. Like they don't even pay attention. Very bad. Yes. Absolutely not. That is an amazing one more thing. Shot. Ugh. Well, Joy, what if you could talk about one more thing <laughs> in this episode, what would you like to discuss? I would like to bring up that Richard has redonned Richard Paul has redonned Richard Paul Detective Paul excuse <laughs> Detective me. Paul has <laughs> has donned his cap of prick once again <laughs> because in this episode he was just utterly you know I gave him so much praise last time for like actually understanding and knowing his police work and then this mm-hmm. episode happens and I'm like what happened, man? He not only were you like snarky and weird and like being weirdly toxically masculine about your ex-wife, mm-hmm. then you lose the witness because she decided to go to the powder room. Yes. And I'm pretty sure part of the reason it was so easy for him to lose her is that he got annoyed with her. Probably. And he was like, sure, I'll go get you coffee. Anything to get away from, quote, banana pants, which is a problem in and of itself. Yeah. And then Kenix has a really great line about, like, go read your Be a Cop manual. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You can't come with us. <laughs> you, can't, you can't come with us. You're not a real cop. What is wrong with you? You lost a witness in a police precinct. But, yes, yeah, so that was my one more thing that, yay, we get to trash on Richard again. <laughs> <laughs> we'll never let one of those opportunities pass us by. Never. <laughs> But yes, I I think Uh, that just about covers it. I don't know anything about the next episode beyond its title, which I'm really excited about. Now, between now and then, we would love to hear from you. Please check us out at Binge O'Clock Pod on Twitter and Facebook, where you can answer the question, if you were invited to Dorian's housewarming party, what gift would you bring? You can also email your answers to us at bingeoclockpod at gmail.com. Yes, and be sure to tell your friends, tell your family, tell your loved ones, tell the clones in your life about Binge O'Clock, and we will see you next time.